Good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be here with you today because I get to share a very exclusive preview of BNF's upcoming 2022 European Energy Transition Outlook. This is Christiana Figueres. I hope that some of you in the audience recognize her because she served two terms as Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC. She was a lead architect of the Paris Agreement and she is one of the main reasons that I came into the energy transition space myself. Now, around five years ago, Ms. Figueres gave a speech in which she talked about the exponential curve of solutions. And what this refers to is how technology, policy and finance are already starting to create economic tipping points that are driving decarbonisation. And this is central to my first key message for you today, that economics are already driving the energy transition here in Europe. So here we have electricity generation in BNF's economics-led baseline scenario. And there are two things going on here that I want to highlight to you. First, wind and solar are growing really rapidly. This is thanks to their economic competitiveness compared with fossil fuels. They are providing almost half of all of our electricity in this region by 2030 and 70% by 2050. You'll also notice here that thermal plants are getting pushed offline. Coal is getting squeezed by carbon prices and gas is also falling out of the mix as renewables are squeezing them out of the merit order. At the same time, we also have economic tipping points happening on the demand side. Electric vehicles are becoming increasingly competitive with internal combustion engines. And you'll see that EVs are forming a fifth of all of our electricity demand by 2050 in this economics-led baseline. So those economic tipping points and that exponential curve of solutions is already starting to have an effect here in Europe. But of course, this only gets us so far. You may be thinking that with all of that wind and solar and all of those electric vehicles that we're on the right track. But in reality, we still have a lot of fossil fuels in the energy mix. Now, this leaves a really quite big gap to net zero. Emissions fall by just a third out until 2050. But in our in upcoming uh, European energy transition outlook, we've created a net zero scenario for Europe where we've looked at what it would take to decarbonize every single sector consuming energy by 2050. That would require tripling the pace of emissions reductions in the region in just three decades. And it relies on two climate solutions, and they are electrification and green hydrogen. So what we've done here is really push the limits of clean electricity and switching to green hydrogen. And the reason we've done this is to have a deeper look at what the implications of these two climate solutions are for the energy system. Now, this scenario is actually pretty interesting in light of the current energy crisis ongoing here in Europe. When Russia invaded Ukraine, and it became very clear that Europe was gonna to need to break its dependence on gas, Executive Vice President Timmermans of the European Commission made it clear that we need to accelerate the pace of the energy transition in order to decouple from gas. So figuring out what that path looks like is even more important than ever. Now I want to share with you for the rest of my time a few thoughts that we should keep in mind when we look at electrification and green hydrogen as solutions for a net zero future. So first, let's look at electrification. Our net zero scenario relies on rapid adoption of electric vehicles, quick uptake of heat pumps and electrification in industry. And as you can see, this drives up power demand in our net zero scenario to nearly double levels that they are today by 2050. This electrification is gonna have really big impacts on our power systems. These new sources of demand fundamentally alter the distribution and flexibility of our power systems, both across the day and across our seasons. Heat pumps introduce seasonal variation into the way that we consume power during those cold winter months. Electric vehicles add variation across the day, depending on when they charge. But electrification, we find, could actually also be a flexibility solution for the grid. For example, electric vehicles 
could charge dynamically during low price hours. And that can help to smooth that curve of demand across the day and help us to integrate more renewables on the grid. More demand, of course, means more clean power is needed. Wind and solar are driving 75% of power, power supply by 2050 in this scenario. And that's being supported by the increasingly competitive nature of battery storage in the system. But this scenario really tests the limits of what wind, solar, and storage can actually do for the grid. By the mid-2030s, these three technologies are supplying 70% of our power by, 20, uh, by 2035. But the progress from there, as you can see here, starts to stagnate. And that's because we need something else to provide clean backup to the grid during lulls of wind and solar output. In our net zero scenario, hydrogen is playing that role. That results in a short-lived transition period for natural gas in the power system as green hydrogen becomes the primary source of backup to the grid. That means almost every single new gas power plant that we're building would need to be hydrogen compatible and conversions of existing gas power plants may need to also be considered. Now that leads quite nicely onto my thoughts for our second climate solution, green hydrogen. Now, we are expecting green hydrogen to need to supply around 22% of final energy here in Europe by 2050. That equates to around 100 million metric tons of clean hydrogen, which is roughly 10 times what Europe currently uses in fossil hydrogen. The main drivers, as you can see, are industry. We also have a little bit of hydrogen coming into the building stock, and of course that power sector for the balancing. Now, I really want to stress that producing this much green hydrogen in Europe really would require a lot of extra clean energy capacity to be delivered. We found that Europe would need around a terawatt of electrolyzers and 1.5 terawatts of wind and solar to deliver all of its green hydrogen needs by 2050. And let's be clear, that is a lot of additional build. We did look at ways that you could try and reduce the amount of renewables that you need by, for example, allowing electrolyzers to charge from excess wind and solar on the grid. But even then, you still need 1.2 terawatts of extra renewables on the grid in order to deliver that much green hydrogen. Now, this opens up really important questions about the future of a hydrogen economy in Europe. Where are we best to locate production? What does this mean for infrastructure, transport, storage? What are the potentials for trade? Now, I want to leave you with two final thoughts. Building all of this renewable energy capacity in Europe is going to need a lot of land. Depending on where we produce our hydrogen, our net zero scenario would rely on anywhere between 1.7 and 3% of land to be used for renewables, up from just 0.2% today. This isn't an impossible task but it is really important that we consider how we approach permitting bottlenecks, how we approach public acceptance of renewables as we progress. Lastly, the transition will rely on scaling investment into clean technologies, particularly wind and solar. In our net zero scenario, we found that new capacity to provide electricity and hydrogen production creates the opportunity for $5.3 trillion of investment in the coming three decades. That will rely on really robust investment signals to the energy industry, which presents really big challenges, but really big opportunities too for policymakers, for companies, and for investors that are navigating the transition. And as a clean energy analyst, if hindsight is anything to go by, that exponential curve of solutions will continue to present all, so all new sources of disruption as we continue to decarbonize the energy system. For those of you with BNF access or a Bloomberg terminal, our full report with all of the data and the eight regions that we modeled as part of this uh, report and the slides from today's presentation will be available next week. Thank you.